uh, welcome. It's great to see such a great crowd today. Um, and I, 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 I'm going to start by issuing a, just a very modest apology for my appearance. I wasn't winged in a gunfight. Um, I had shoulder surgery uh, at the end of January and had my uh, whole left shoulder replaced with a couple of uh, hunks of, I think it was titanium or something like that, so I can set off metal detectors. And uh, originally I was supposed to have the surgery two weeks earlier than it actually happened, and I thought by this time I'd be in the thing. Didn't happen. Did you know you can't wrap a towel around yourself with one hand? <laughs> Some, somebody can, probably, but I can't. So, uh, yeah, sweatpants and a, and a loose sweater are more my style now because it's a little easier to get dressed that way, and that's why I, that's why I like this and, and in this. So, uh, on to the program. I have a tale to tell. Actually, I have several to tell, and our theme is, is local history today. And I'd like you all to think about history and, and how this present moment <coughs> are all living in together is the accumulation of all the moments that have gone before. There's an old joke about, tell me how this happened. Well, first the earth cooled. <laughs> Everything that, that has gone before has come down to this point. And it's a little astounding to me that I'm standing here and telling you, <clears throat> I, we all have a personal history, right? My personal history includes 43 years ago, in February, I started as the director of this library. I can't believe it's been that long. It adds up, the library was founded in 1888, so if you do the math, I've been the director of this library for just shy of a third of its history. <laughs> and that, that makes scary. me dizzy just thinking it is scary. It's, it's scary as heck. But uh, when, when I came here on uh, February 16, 1976, do y'all remember 1976? Do you remember what, no. what was going on that year? The bicentennial. The American Revolution bicentennial. And it was, it was a stroke of fortune for me, as well as everybody else, that in Mount Vernon, uh, they had decided a couple of years before that that part of their uh, bicentennial activities was going to be the uh, production of the bicentennial history of Mount Vernon and Knox County which is, this is actually the second edition of it, but they came out with this in early, I actually it might have been late 1975, um, was uh, uh, basically produced under the editorial direction of Fred Lorry, who had been the editor of the Mount Vernon News for a long, long time. He died quite a few years ago now. Uh, but uh, it, a lot of people uh, contributed to it, and it was um, kind of a, a, a godsend for me because when I first drove into to Mount Vernon. When I came to, to interview for the job, I thought, this is a special place. I could tell the history just kind of emanated from it. I drove around the, the square, and I saw the, the uh, Civil War statue, and I saw the building that I later learned was called the Kremlin Building. I thought, man, that's a neat piece of architecture. There's got to be some real history here. Boy, is there ever. So um, I was new here, and this helped me to kind of start delving into local history. I've been interested in it and reading about it ever since, had some interesting experiences along that way. Um, and I, I'm, I am far, far from an authority on, on Mount Vernon and Knox County history, but there are some parts of it that I've learned a little bit about and that, that I'm going to share with you today. So, first thing that happened, obviously, I started reading it in the Fred Laurie's History of Knox County, and I saw, wow, there was a hanging. Ooh. And I, and I wanted to find out more about that. We have newspapers on microfilm that go back that far. Then, uh, it, during my first year here, my, uh, my clerk treasurer was a lady named March Jenry, and she had brought something from home. It was a box. I don't remember what was in it, actually, but it was wrapped in some old newspapers. Really, really, really old newspapers. And we're unwrapping it, and I'm looking at these newspapers, and I see this, what looks like a handwritten map, and it says, location of the body. <laughs> uh, it, was, uh, it was all fragments, <clears throat> and I'm reading little, <clears throat> little pieces of the story as it was printed in, in this news. I couldn't even tell what newspaper it was at first, and I'm looking for a date, frantically, and what is this? It was 1905, and little by little I found out, well, that was, this was the story of the murder of Miranda Bricker, or Miranda Bricker. We're going to talk about what her first name was. It's, it's still not settled. Um, but I, I managed, I thought, I can find that in our our microfilm newspapers. Now, back then, all we had for a microfilm reader was uh, an old codograph. If you've ever heard of that, it's, it was an old thing. It looked like a little pyramid. The microfilm went on top, and there was a crank on the side, and there was a little screen surrounded by little walls that kept the light out so you could see the image. And I practically wrecked my right arm cranking that thing <laughs> going through uh, old copies of the Mount Vernon Democratic Banner and the Republican News. There were two competing newspapers in Mount Vernon at the time. 
political party oriented, which made it cool to read about elections, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I pieced together the story, and I found the actual page that that little map had been handwritten on. And one of our two stories today, which is actually the second one because it was 1905, um, it turned out to be that story. And that's what <coughs> off to the races. Um, about a year after I started here, actually in April of 77, uh, I was invited to uh, go on the radio with Charlie Kilkenny on, during National Library Week. And we started talking about this, and I started telling him about this story that we'd unearthed, and he was fascinated. And I ended up doing an entire hour-long radio program about it, and uh, that just sort of cemented everything. One other thing that happened within the first couple of years that I was here, um, I got a letter from a man named Lester Williams in Colorado. He was the son of Clinton Williams, who had been a local insurance salesman in Mount Vernon, who was, he, I guess he was kind of an amateur photographer, but he also was a collector of photographs, especially of Mount Vernon and Knox County history, old photographs. And his son Lester, <coughs> he had passed on quite a long time uh, before that, but his son Lester was, had the collection of, of his pictures and he wanted to know what to do with them. He said, uh, I'd send them to, um, to Mount Vernon, but the, the Knox County Historical Society has no museum at that time. He said, would, would the library take care of them? And if there's ever a historical museum, would you give them to the museum? I wrote back and said, sure. This was before email, by the way, so it was all <laughs> US Postal Service. Um, and he sent this big box of, of photographs. Well, over the course of years, he sent me a few more things. And um, one of the things that he sent me was a little artifact that we'll share with you in a little bit. But our first story today, you want to put the first slide up? <coughs> and forgive my voice. A little under the weather. <coughs> our first story today is about this guy, William S. Bergen, one of the more colorful characters in local history. He was a Civil War veteran. He was born in 1848. Now, if you do the math, 1848 to 1865 is not a long span of years. He was about 12 years old when the Civil War started. And he was uh, apparently a, well, he was born in Biggs County in 1848. His parents moved around a little bit. Uh, and by the time he was 10 years old, they were in Mount Vernon. His uh, school teachers remember him as being a bright boy, sharp, quick-witted, had a sharp sense of humor. And uh, when, when the Civil War broke out, he wanted to go. Well, he was only a kid. He ran away three times. And each time, his dad went and went after him two times as far as Cincinnati, which in those days was quite a trek. I presume he went by train. Uh, one time to Newark and brought him back. But the kid just wanted to go and enlist in the army in the Civil War. Well, when he was 15, his parents finally said, OK. 15 years old, they enlisted him in the 121st Ohio Volunteer Infantry. And he ended up marching with Sherman on Sherman's famous March to the Sea. In 1864, he was wounded. I forget the name of the battle now. Altoona Mountain, I think it is, something like that, in Georgia. And um, he was uh, hit in the wrist by a mini ball, shattered the bones in his forearm. I don't even know which arm it was. Um, but it had to be amputated just below the elbow. So he was an amputee veteran of the Civil War. Uh, after he mustered out of the Civil War, he went uh, several places. He, he uh, had a job at the Ohio Adjutant General's <coughs> Office in, in Columbus for a couple of years. He was in Washington, D.C. at the War Office as a clerk for at least a year. Um, he traveled back and forth. Uh, he would send letters to his friends and his family from, first he was in Maine cutting down pine trees, and then he'd be in Georgia overseeing a cotton mill. And then he was in Texas herding cattle with cattlemen. And then he was in the Dakota Territory running away from the Indians. He, uh, he was, not, and I, I'm not sure if he was in the regular army or if he just had like a civilian job with the army, but he was with Custer's troops. Uh, shortly before the Battle of the Little Bighorn. He would have been there, and that might have been the end of his story, but Custer sent him with a message to Fort Fetterman, so he was off-site when the battle occurred, and later he went to the battle site and saw the, the bodies of all the, the guys that he had been cohorts with, friends, military buddies, comrades in arms, um, and that was one year before he came back to Mount Vernon. He was in a bad state, his, uh, his mother uh, testified later that he was, he'd been drinking, he was uh, irritable, he was just kind of in a, in a really agitated state. And he became then, later, 
he committed murder, and he became the first and only person in Knox County, hanged in Knox County for capital murder. Um, what's our next slide? Oh, yeah, okay. So on the morning of uh, it, it, uh, roughly, okay, the Battle of the Little Bighorn was June 26, 1876, I believe. And on June 15, 1877, a little less than a year after that, he was back in town. He had been in town for maybe a week or two at that point. And uh, this is the Bergen House Hotel. His family ran a hotel. This was on South Main Street at the corner of uh, Ohio and, and Maine. Um, you can see in this picture there was a, an entrance on, on Main Street. That was the main entrance. And there was a side entrance to the north on Ohio Avenue. And he had been there the night before, and uh, they wouldn't let him have a room. Uh, at, at this time, even though it was still called the Bergen House Hotel, it was run by other people named McBride. Thomas McBride and his son were, uh, and they leased the building from somebody else, but they, they were running a hotel there, and it was still called the Bergen House. And they refused him a, a room the night before. Well, about 7.30 in the morning on Friday, June 15th, he comes back and he says, I left a satchel here and I want it. Uh, some reports indicate that, that what was in the satchel was his discharge papers from the army that he needed to get his pension or something like that. Nobody knows for sure exactly. But McBride said, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about your satchel. Well, Bergen became testy and was arguing with him. And uh, McBride said, well, the guy, that, the night clerk, is at home. He's asleep. He'll be in later in the afternoon. I can ask him then. That wasn't good enough for Bergen. He said, well, I'll go ask the baggage master who was upstairs. Um, he went and asked the baggage master. The baggage master said, I don't know anything about a So McBride went back downstairs and he said, I'm sorry, we just don't know where your satchel is. We'll ask the night clerk when he comes in. Well, Bergen got huffy, made threats, and stormed out. The story is that he first went to a lawyer's office who told him that he wanted to get a court order to get his satchel back. The lawyer said, you don't need a court order. You, 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 you can settle this easily enough. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Bergen's next uh, trip was to a gun shop on Gambier Street, the gun shop of C.P. Gregory, where he uh, examined some of the wares and he uh, settled on a, a pistol called a blue jacket. It was a 32 caliber <coughs> revolver. And he said, I'd like to try it out. Can I fire it? And the, uh, the shop owner said, well, not here, obviously. But here, I'll put two shells in the chamber. Oh, and you take it down by the river and shoot it off. And if you like it, bring it back and you can buy it. Okay, well, Bergen didn't go down to the river to shoot the gun off. He went straight to the Bergen House Hotel. He went in the front door. At that point, uh, Thomas McBride, T.J. McBride, the younger, uh, was sitting on the outside the uh, north entrance of the building in a chair along with uh, one of the guests whose name was Underwood, who was a lightning rod salesman. And apparently, they were talking about lightning rods. Maybe they were going to buy some at the hotel. Bergen went in the front door, out the side door, and shot McBride dead on the spot. Mm -hmm. Now, the bullet entered his, his, the side of his head just above the ear. Uh, he actually lasted about two hours after that. Underwood jumped up and, and dragged his body into the, into the building. And at that point, uh, Bergen sat down in the chair that Underwood had just jumped out of and was apparently very leisurely telling people, yeah, I shot him. I shot him like a man. <laughs> I just, you know, so. Uh, they obviously called for law enforcement, a deputy came, and Bergen said, I will not resist you, I shot him, and they took him to jail. Um, the ride lasted for another two hours, he was apparently in great agony, flopping around, he was unconscious, but he was still in distress, and then he died. His wife had been in Newark with their child, visiting some people, she came on the afternoon train, and the news stories in the, in the Democratic banner and the public news folks talk about her throwing herself on his body, imploring him to speak to her, but he was already very dead. And uh, so it's kind of a, a very emotional scene, obviously. Mm -hmm. So a grand jury is convened, and uh, Bergen is charged with first-degree murder. Uh, the <coughs> trial did not occur until August of that year. There was a, the uh, defense attorneys asked for a change of venue because they thought, um, he can't get a fair trial in this town, everybody knows he's guilty. <laughs> and there was a lot of excitement about this. Um, we have, what do we have next? Okay, well, yeah, okay. Uh, he had two attorneys at the time. Um, one was uh, Colonel Morgan, and I don't know anything about him, but the junior attorney in the case was William Coons. Now, 
he ended up, William Coons ended up having a very long, like 63 year career in uh, law in Mount Vernon. He was very prominent. This is a picture of him in his later years. It's not the best image uh, possible. I'm not sure how old he was at that time. In this one, he was um, in his 80s. He practiced law all the way up until I think it was about 1938. He uh, was a defense attorney in at least nine different criminal cases, and this was his first, and he lost. <coughs> Um, but uh, the, uh, yeah, the defense attorneys um, wanted to change the venue. It was, it was argued, and there was a continuance, and finally the court said, no, we're going to have the trial here in Knox County. And uh, it was in August. It was a fairly long affair. There was a lot of testimony from a number of different uh, people, the, the family of the, the victim, uh, Bergen's family. Uh, the, 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 the defense was essentially uh, insanity. Now this was quite a while before Sigmund Freud, and uh, psychiatry was not really a science at the time, I don't think. And so there was, there, they had several different doctors, they were kind of contradictory. They all sort of agreed that insanity was the result of epilepsy in the family, that it was passed down from grandfather to grandson, that it would, it would skip a, a generation, so on and so forth. Huh. But um, in the end, the, uh, the uh, prosecution said he wasn't insane, he's just, he's just a bad guy. And, um, but, but it's obvious that, you know, less than a year after, you know, he had his arm shot off in the Civil War, and then he led a rather, what should we say, cavalier life, and then uh, less than a year before this, he saw the bodies of all of his friends at Little Bighorn. Maybe it affected his emotional state. Who, who can say? We don't really know. But the, so the defense was insanity, and, uh, but the prosecution, and during the summation, the prosecution said, if he is found not guilty by reason of insanity, he won't be sent to the insane asylum. He'll be set loose to wander the streets of Mount Vernon like a Bengal tiger looking for his next victim. Do you want, you know, to the jurors, do you want that to happen? And so the jury was uh, sent off to the jury room to deliberate. Everybody thought it would be hours, and so the courtroom had been packed. Uh, it cleared out, everybody went to have lunch or whatever. There were people there with their children. Um, but the courtroom emptied out 45 minutes is all it took the jury to return a verdict of guilty. Uh, apparently back in those days, they rang a bell. And so everybody heard the bell signaling that the jury was back. And there was apparently a mob scene, everybody rushing back to the courthouse. Within minutes of the bell, it was packed and the, uh, the verdict was announced. Well, there were some appeals made to the governor for clemency and the commutation of the sentence and so forth. None of those worked out. And so December 7, 1877, was set as the date of the execution of William Bergen, and it was to take place in Knox County, in fact, in a small courtyard between the jail and the, uh, and the courthouse. And here's where the story starts to get really interesting, as if it wasn't already interesting enough. What's our next slide? Oh yeah. Um, <coughs> for now. Okay, yeah. So a lot of a uh, lot of newspaper headlines, a lot of lurid detail about everything. Um, about the post mortem on T.J. McBride, um, scenes and incidents, as it says, all kinds of comprehensive coverage. They actually, on the actual afternoon of the murder, they published the, the banner published a special edition. How they got it out that quickly. I don't know. I mean, they, they did not have computers, and you know, I mean, printing in those days was typeset. Um, they, they worked really fast. Um, one of the next ones. So yes, this is this was the uh, jail, uh, and there's the courthouse. This is a uh, from 1852 to 1914. That was torn down, and there was another jail there, and then of course that was torn down too. Um, but um, there was a small courtyard between the jail and the courthouse, and they constructed the gallows there. And uh, I don't know what, there are several things that run through two of our stories today, and Dayton is one of them, Dayton, Ohio. For some reason, in our second story, we'll talk about how they uh, got dogs from Dayton, Ohio to chase after the, the uh, perp. But in this case, um, the, uh, the rope, for the hanging was brought from Dayton, and they're, apparently they're experts in Dayton on how to hang people. And one guy in particular had, had volunteered to tie the knot, to tie the noose, put it together and so forth. So um, at, at, uh, at noon on December 7, 1877, 
there was a, uh, they had a crowd of about 200 people who had tickets to the hanging. Now, <laughs> you want to show this picture of the ticket? The, the newspaper actually published a, um, a, a, a replica of the ticket. One of the things that Lester Williams sent me from Colorado was the actual ticket. Now, here's the thing. Clinton Williams, who collected the pictures, was the son-in-law of William Coons, the defense attorney. I don't know for a fact, but I think this was probably the ticket that was actually issued to the defense attorney, William Coons. Wow. Do you want to handle this carefully? It didn't come. It, he sent it to me in an envelope. Just, you can see that it's been taped into somebody's album and so forth. Oh. I will send this around. <laughs> this better not disappear, okay? Everybody will need to. This may be another hanging. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, <clears throat> Sheriff John Gay was the uh, lucky guy that got to conduct uh, the ceremony. And uh, they brought uh, Bergen out to the gallows that they constructed. Um, and uh, got him in place, put the noose around his neck. The, uh, the uh, religious person, I'm not sure if it was, um, I should know his name. Anyway, the, the minister was there, um, ministering to Bergen and saying a prayer and so forth. And as soon as he pronounced the benediction, the trap was sprung, and Bergen's body went down and landed with a thud on the floor beneath because the noose slipped. Oh, now, in a lot of stories, you will see some people think a lot of, and, and I talked to a lot of local people that knew who were familiar with the story, and they said the rope broke. No, the rope did not break. Um, it slipped. The actual now, and uh, very recently, when the the uh, the doctor who conducted the post mortem on William Berger, they they had to think that the second attempt was successful. Okay, they had a backup noose apparently. <laughs> Why you would think, well, just in case, you know, <laughs> we'll have another one. And they had they lifted him back up through the, the trap door and got him back on the, uh, on, the on the gallows, reset the trap, and put a, a fresh rope and a new noose uh, from the beam above. And a few minutes later, the minister went through the prayer again, and boom, next time, yes, he, it, it worked. Um, <clears throat> but Dr. Laramore was the, Dr. Frank Laramore, who was one of the original trustees of this library, by the way, uh, conducted a post-mortem and later wrote an, an article in the Medical Journal of Ohio about it and, and basically said that the, the guy that, uh, that tied the knot was supposed to be an expert. Well, maybe not so much. The knot that was supposed to keep the thing from slipping, he said, was the size of an elephant. Um, <laughs> Yeah, with Dr. Laramore's words in, in, his, in, in his article. But apparently not enough to actually keep the whole thing together. And it, apparently if the knot's not tied right, it just like, floop, like a slip knot, and that's what happened. So on the second attempt, what Dr. Laramore's article was really about, he was talking about the method of execution and what really happens. He said the idea is to break the guy's neck, and by which he, he it's in medical terminology in there that I can't yeah. recite because I can't remember it. But anyway, he said what actually happened in Bergen's case and what happens in the case of most hangings is strangulation. Bergen, at the end of the rope, 18 minutes it took for his heart to stop beating. And during that time, during the first four minutes, according to Dr. Laramore, he aspirated some air. How that was even possible, I don't know. Um, but then during the next four minutes, there was no aspiration, and the venous circulation of blood from the brain was cut off, and uh, but it took a total of 18 minutes for a bird to actually die on the gallows. So, grisly stuff. Um, there was a, a broadside put out. You know what a broadside is? It's something that people post on walls and so forth. Written by a guy named J.W. Flynn. Here we go. You can't read it very well there, so I'm going to read it to you. <clears throat> this was not composed by Shakespeare. You'll uh, get that right away. My name is William Bergen. The same I will never deny, and I will the truth uphold to you when I am going to die. I own I shot McBride and did it intentionally, which brings me to a disgraceful end upon the gallows tree. Oh, how sorry and how lonely and forsaken I do feel, confined in an iron cell, my friends, inside of the county jail. If I only had my liberty, how happy I would be, I would wander the world over and avoid the gallows tree. 
Six months have I been imprisoned, and I would willingly be six more, rather than meet with my dying hour, which makes my heart feel sore. <laughs> to think that day is drawing nigh, how sad it will be to me when I shall march with a trembling heart upon the gallows tree. The day of my execution, hundreds came together there. It seems to indicate that this was written after the fact, but I don't really know. <laughs> uh, to, to watch my dying moments, but not my life to spare. Undaunted with a fearless thought, I approached the scaffold high in hopes the great and merciful God would pardon me when I die. All you that stand around me, my wretched fate to see, do not glory in my downfall, but I pray you, pity me. You believe I am dying willfully, but I bid the world adieu. Farewell, my loving mother, I grieve to part with you. Come all you wild and wicked youths, wherever you may be, I hope you will pay attention and warning take by me. Do not take the life of others, or you will trouble see. It will bring you to a woeful end, just as it has done for me. So, yeah, this, uh, who, uh, how this, I have no idea, anyway, we came across this. Um, as they were, uh, as they were getting uh, Bergen back up onto the gallows for the second try, um, different sources say different things about it. One, one source says, he said, this is a bad murder. And uh, as, as they were putting the second news over his head, he apparently said to the sheriff, do a better time this, uh, do a better job this time, Johnny. I choked a little, but I can stand it. And so, those were his last words. <coughs> so, we have, got the picture here. So he was then buried in uh, Mountview Cemetery. And uh, there's his, his uh, gravestone, is the one that's broken off here. No idea why or how that happened, but uh, there it is. Um, to add to our artifacts, the American Joe Hawkins has bought, brought along, she delved into the actual archives of Knox County and the, uh, I don't know if I can hold this up or not. Well, I don't think you can. <laughs> the actual file entries here of the, of the court records of the Bergen hanging right here. So, uh, take a look at that. Maybe people can. There we are. So that is story number one today. And uh, the thread that, that that uh, connects, besides the fact that they're both local history, the thread that connects that to our next story is William Coons, believe it or not. And, um, what did I say the next slide we're going to be? Okay, yeah. So, I mentioned, I mentioned that you come across some very old newspapers with a fragment of a map and some fragment of the news story. This was it. This was the thing that first caught my attention. Uh, and which, which uh, led me on a, a little, um, historical research of my own in the, in the newspapers to find out about the murder of Marina Bricker in 1905 on the estate known as Maplehurst at the time. It belonged to the Fairchild family. Frank Fairchild was uh, a businessman. He was uh, part owner of the Cooper Bessemer Company. He was a banker. Uh, he was one of the original trustees of this library also. And uh, <coughs> his, uh, his home, was at a place at the corner of uh, Gambier Street and Division. Now, I want you to look at this map. What do you notice about this first? Anybody? North is to the east. North is on the left, right. East is at the top. It used to be that always maps were, or this is the, the word oriented means this actually. It means east, right? East was at the top because east was in the direction of what? Bethlehem. Oh. And so, yeah, so everything was, everything was about Jesus back then, right? And um, so, so maps were, were situated at, with the east at the top, and that's why, that's how you were oriented, orient means east, um, and so that's the way they, they put this map, but actually you have to tilt your head to the left, here's Division Street, here's Gambier Street, and so the, the front entrance to this fabulous estate, Maplehurst, was a, a little walkway off of Division Street. This is, the, this is the image that got me started. And <clears throat> so here's the story. April 22nd, 1905 was a Saturday, was the day before Easter Sunday. Easter came a little late that year. And um, it, it was just a normal day for all intents and purposes. And a maid in the uh, household of the Fairchild, her name, and once again, as I say, there was even one news story where her name was rendered as, in one paragraph as Miranda, M-I-R-A-N-D-A, 
and in another paragraph as Marinda, M-A-R-I-N-D-A. Easy to see how people might think it was a typo, I guess. But this is the way it appeared in the newspaper and with the largest picture. This is, I don't know who did the drawing, uh, but this is the best uh, image we have of her. She was apparently tall, slender, about 120 pounds. She, had the, she was born in Howard Township. Um, at the time that she was in the Fairchild household, she had a sister who lived on Walnut Street, which is now South Sandusky Street. And uh, she had been visiting her on that evening, Saturday the 22nd. Uh, she had been a cook at the Kenyon Military Academy, which I guess was one of the incarnations of Kenyon College way back when. Um, and she had had a number of other jobs, but she'd only been in the Fairchild household for a few months since about the previous October. Uh, but was, was uh, unmarried, uh, had no dependents, and so had a sort of free life as a maid. And on that day, on that evening actually, she'd been downtown, apparently a lot of people were downtown shopping, shops were open, some of them apparently fairly late. And uh, on her way home, uh, she was accosted, she was almost back home, she was accosted and raped and murdered in the, uh, on the lawn uh, by the house, by the Maple Bridge. We can go back, here we go. Um, there were a couple of stories, that she, her, her, okay, I'm gonna try to put this in an approximate chronological order. There were two different stories that developed about where she went, where, what her movements were just before the murder. One of them was that she got on a, a, a streetcar. Mount Vernon had electric streetcars at the time. Uh, the one streetcar line ran out High Street, and she would have gotten off at Division and then walked south and um, to, to Maplehurst. And her pocketbook was found here. And one theory was that as she was walking south on Division Street, she knew she was being followed by somebody. And the motorman who uh, operated the trolley that she got off of said that another guy had gotten off at the same time. The man he described in a, a tan coat, uh, smooth complexion, just a guy, uh, got off and apparently went the same direction that she did, or that the, the lady that got off the, the trolley car did. The question is, was it this Brooker or was it somebody else? Anyway, the theory was that she had come down, down this way, she realized she was being followed, thought she was going to be robbed, threw her pocketbook over the hedge, and it so it landed there, and then ran in here. And in the meantime, the, the guy that was following her went around this way and intercepted her. She was pretty badly beaten. Uh, her nose was broken, which caused a nosebleed, which caused a lot of blood. Um, she had dentures, and her, the dentures in her lower jaw were knocked all the way out of her mouth and found on the grass uh, near the body. Um, her clothing was scattered. This is about this is a couple hundred feet here. Uh, so her clothing was scattered around the, the lawn, and, um, but her body was, was right, right here near the hedge. So that was one theory. But it later developed that likely she actually just walked down Gambier Street from downtown because the last person to see her was uh, the city service director who apparently knew her, knew who she was, and, and saw her on uh, Main Street headed toward Gambier Street. So one theory got, got exploded very early on. But uh, early in the morning of uh, Easter Sunday, the 23rd, oh, sorry, one other, one other little tidbit that developed later, and about, this occurred maybe about 9, between 9 and 9.30. Uh, a lady across the street, Mrs. Swigert, was giving her daughter medicine around 9 or 9.15, and she heard someone cry out, a woman's voice cry out, oh my gosh! So she sent her 10-year-old son, Coleman, to go and look. Uh, it was a very dark night. There were electric street lights. I don't think they were very good. Um, it, the moon rose at 10.32, so at 9 o'clock it was still pitch dark, very dark night. Her son went out, he looked, he said he thought there was somebody over in the yard across the street, uh, but he couldn't see what they were doing or what was going on. He thought somebody had fallen and they were helping this person get up. <laughs> Who knows? He couldn't tell for sure exactly if it was two or three people or what. And there were buggies apparently going by on Gander Avenue at the time. So about 15 minutes later, Mrs. Swigert herself went out to look, and she saw what looked like, she couldn't tell, two or three figures, she couldn't tell if they were male or female or anything about them, just, you know, and she thought they were drunks who were, maybe one of them had fallen and the other was helping 
form. So she may have actually witnessed the murder in, in progress. About a half an hour later, around 10 o'clock, the cook in the Fairchild household, whose name was Anna McChrystal, walked by, went in this walk, and saw this hat on the ground and thought, well, that's curious. Picked it up, looked at it, did not recognize it, apparently didn't realize it was Miranda Bricker's hat, put it back down. She thought, maybe somebody lost it, and if so, they'll come back looking for it, so I'll put it there and they'll find it. Walked into the house, not realizing that a few hundred feet away, the dead body of her, her co-worker in the Fairchild household was lying there. So the next morning, about 9 o'clock, <laughs> Another uh, worker in the household is getting breakfast ready, looks out the window and sees the body on the lawn and screams, realizes right away this is something bad. And um, we, Mr. Fairchild called the police. Sheriff Schellenbarger and Prosecutor Lot Stillwell were on the scene very shortly after that, and uh, so was a crowd of people. They gathered very, very quickly, such that uh, Sheriff had guards put around to try and keep people from defiling the murder scene. That didn't work so well. There were just a lot of people milling around all over the place. And uh, what they found, the, uh, the, the throwing the pocketbook theory was discredited because there's a hedge here and it was actually under the hedge. So they thought it couldn't actually land it. They thought maybe the, well actually, the pocketbook they knew had had several silver dollars in it. They were missing but there was a $5 bill folded up that was still inside the purse when they recovered it. It had blood stains on the outside of the purse. Um, and they sort of thought, well, in the darkness, the killer rifled through, found the silver dollars, missed the folded up bill, and then just threw the pocketbook and it landed there. Um, it was a pretty brutal thing. Uh, besides, probably, the, the, the uh, newspaper coverage of the post-mortem was interesting. It didn't really exactly specify a cause of death. Likely she was strangled, but they, the out, outside marks on her body didn't quite jive with that. There was a theory that chloroform was used, um, although nothing came of that as far as I can tell. Um, but uh, so the exact manner of her death, she was asphyxiated in one way or another. The uh, tissues of her throat were apparently <coughs> collapsed, and um, that's about all they said of, uh, about the, uh, the postmortem. They, they had several uh, news articles about the postmortem, which was apparently conducted at her sister's house, uh, her sister's wedding. <coughs> and um, so they, they, they weren't real specific about exactly what happened, but clearly there was quite a, a struggle that occurred because the, the grass <coughs> occurred and somebody dragged somebody, whether she dragged the, the, her attacker as she was trying to get away from him or he dragged her. There were footprints in this kitchen garden that was very muddy, it had just been uh, dug up in Spain, and so there were, uh, there were muddy footprints that went in several directions. And um, the, the, the killer apparently wandered around that part of the property for a while and then took off in which direction they couldn't really tell. So, but there was clothing, her skirt and so forth was, was scattered around here, the hat there, and uh, the whole grass uh, all the way across there was badly disturbed. So there's quite a row that took place. So the sheriff decided we've got to get dogs to try and track the killer. And uh, he called to Dayton. <coughs> Once again, Dayton. Uh, <clears throat> and it took, uh, they, they thought they'd get there on, they, they missed the train that would have gotten in there in the afternoon. The dogs actually arrived around midnight. And there was still a crowd. There was still a crowd. They were having to keep people away. So the dogs started, they, they, uh, there were three of them. They were named Jesse James, <laughs> Bonifus the Third and Vigilant. Those were the three dogs. <laughs> they, were, they were experienced bloodhounds. They had, they, they tracked like, one of them had tracked 57 different cases. And of course, bloodhounds, their sense of smell is like 10,000 times more acute than ours. So they can actually track somebody, <coughs> even after a rain has, has, has uh, occurred, they, they can actually follow a scent. Well, they took off, they went around for a little bit, and then went down. Um, south of Gambier Street along towards the quarry and back. They went just all over the place for several miles, but ended up uh, at North Mackenzie Street and Ann Street at the household of uh, a lady named Elizabeth Copeland, whose son, George, was at home in bed. And uh, <clears throat> the bloodhounds went to the back door and were banging around the back door. The sheriff went up and pounded on the door and went in. 
This is uh, Mrs. Copeland opened the door and he said, who all is in this house? And then she said, well, I live here with my son and my daughter and we have a boarder whose name was uh, Jerome Newman, uh, who was an older person. The sheriff took a look at Jerome Newman. They were all a black family, by the way. The sheriff took a look at George or at, uh, at Jerome Newman. He thought, no, not this guy. Um, obviously not the mother. He took a look at George Copeland and got him out of bed. He was 18 years old, a former high school football player, pretty muscular. He had no idea what was going on, except he had heard about the murder earlier in the day. He didn't know that. And the sheriff said, get dressed, you're coming with me. <laughs> Took him to the, the, the jail. He was uh, interrogated by the sheriff. He was interrogated by the uh, prosecutor. And William Coons, our friend William Coons, was uh, retained, I think, pro bono, I'm not sure, um, as his defense attorney. And uh, the, next, uh, the next morning, um, the, uh, the, the sheriff and the prosecutor had been grilling um, George Copeland for some period of time before Coons got there. He was late getting in and he was furious that they had put him through what they called the sweating without him there to defend his clients. But Stillwell said, don't worry, everything he said this morning is much more favorable to his case than anything he said right after he was arrested. Apparently he was confused. He, there were different stories about where he had been that night and who had seen him and so on and so forth. But he gave a fairly coherent accounting, ultimately, that he had, uh, he had been at work. He, he was a waiter at a restaurant called Turner's. And uh, afterward, he went to a pool hall, and he was there until shortly before 11. And then he walked home up Main Street. He was never on that side of town. So this is where um, racism rears its ugly head, because there was, in, in the first few days, uh, as these things were being reported in the newspapers, there was one rumor that someone uh, had, had a, a conclusive proof that the crime was committed by a Negro. Seriously? That never went any further than that, but they, there were all these things about, well, they found uh, footprints <coughs> and his, his shoe matched the footprints. It was the same size shoe. Well, it was a pretty ordinary shoe size. Um, it had had, they could tell from the footprint in the, in the ground that it had had a half sole recently replaced. Well, back then, shoes were not disposable items in kind of the way they are now. And having a shoe repaired by a replacement of a half sole, how many people in Mount Vernon had a shoe that size with, with their half sole that had been replaced? So, but all of these little things. And there was a blue cap found in the alleyway. I need to go back to the, the map, yeah. Um, this is an alleyway right here. There's a blue cap found right about there, or in the general vicinity. And there were two or three people who swore they saw George Copeland wearing that very same blue hat only days earlier. And they asked him, do you have a hat like that? No, I don't have a hat like that. So, but people swore they saw George Copeland uh, wearing that same blue hat. And they were sure it was the same thing. Um, well, a day or two later, a lady named Mrs. Vincent owned up that that was her daughter's hat. She had been given it as a gift on Saturday, that very Saturday. Uh, they were visiting somebody on Vine Street, and they all went for a buggy ride, and, and uh, they, the buggy had come down Division Street, and apparently the hat was lost. It was her daughter's hat, a child, actually. So that, that one didn't pan out. So for, um, for the first few days after the, uh, after the murder, the, the papers were filled with all of these lurid details, uh, with the investigation, with the, all of the case against George Copeland was, was aired in the newspapers. Just one problem, he didn't do it. Uh, he was kept in jail, well they first of all they took him, actually they, they feared a lynch mob and supposedly there was a, an angry scene at his house, people threw rocks, somebody had a rope. I'm not sure that all that is exactly true because there was some um, inkling in some of the news coverage that other newspapers like the Columbus Dispatch for one had sort of amplified some of the details just to, to get a good story, right? So exactly how large the crowds were, uh, trying to lynch George Copeland, nobody's sure. Um, exactly how excited the crowds were, nobody's sure. But uh, one thing we can say, there were so many people milling around there that um, anybody could have left the scent that the dogs were, were tracing, right? The scene had been completely destroyed. Yeah. And it was later, <coughs> excuse me, much later, 
established that there was somebody who was right there um, in the crowd as they were lifting the body onto the stretcher to take it for the post-mortem. And that person walked around Mount Vernon and ended up at the Copeland house. I was a friend of George Copeland's. He's never named. We don't know who he is. Um, I just found out within the last two days, there was a, a Knox Pages last October, Mark Jordan did a two-part series on this very same case. And he speculates that it was that friend of George Copeland's that was the actual killer. Who knows? No, nobody, nobody can say. But they kept George Copeland in the Knox County Jail. They first took him to Centerburg and then to Columbus that night because they were afraid that he would be lynched. Uh, he was in jail, in, in the Columbus Jail, City Jail, for a few days, and then they brought him back here. Apparently everybody had calmed down, and from that point on, he was kept in the jail. And um, there were proceedings against him, but Mary Jo finds no case filing, right? That's, that's fascinating, because in the newspaper it says, finally, it took about a week, I think, or maybe longer than that, for uh, Prosecutor Stilwell, according to the newspapers, filed an actual murder charge against him. There was never a trial. A few more weeks, uh, and um, it, it was uh, early July that he was finally released. But what they finally uh, concluded, um, and I, I can uh, almost imagine the scene, excuse me, <coughs> with uh, defense attorney Coons and prosecutor Stilwell in a room together going over everything, and <coughs> Coons saying, you realize, excuse me, <laughs> you realize all of this stuff actually tends to prove his innocence rather than, than his guilt, and Stilwell had to agree to that, even though the papers were having him filing charges um, within a few weeks after this. Um, there was one episode in the middle of May where the, there were two girls who said that they had been on Gambier Street uh, that night at about the time of the murder, that they had seen a tall, slender woman that they didn't recognize walking down Gambier Street towards Maplehurst. And shortly after that, they saw another person walking the same direction on Gambier Street who was, they, they, it was so dark they couldn't tell whether he was white or black. They couldn't tell anything about him, but they knew what he, his general you know, shape. And so the sheriff decided he was going to do a little experiment. He had these girls on an evening in May position themselves outside Maplehurst and he said to uh, Copeland, come on, we're going to get you some fresh air. And they walked him down Gambier Street while the girls <coughs> came by. And as the girls were approaching and passing, Sheriff Schellenbarger said to him, well, how's it feel to be outside for a while? And he said, oh, I like being out in the fresh air, and so on and so forth, and then walked on by. Well, the girls couldn't identify him by face. They didn't recognize his face. Uh, he was supposedly in the same clothes that he wore on April 22nd. And uh, they couldn't recognize his clothes or anything about him, but his form. Yes, sir, they recognized that. His, the voice was different. <laughs> because the person that they had seen that night said something to them like, how do you do, ladies, or something like that. And um, it was a different voice. But they said, that form, yes, sir, we recognize that form. We will never forget that form. It's, that's absolutely the same person. No, it wasn't. Um, so finally, George Copeland was released, and um, the crime was never solved. It remains an unsolved crime in, uh, in Knox County history. There's an epilogue to this. How much time do we have? Look good. Um, Sheriff Schellenbarger was very popular. Uh, he was in the newspaper a lot. Uh, Sheriff Schellenbarger goes to investigate such and such, and sometimes you know little uh, offshoots of this story or other stories. Sheriff Schellenbarger had no idea when he investigated this case that he would not survive that year of 1905. Uh, about the end of May. About May 31st, uh, there was a case out, um, I forget where it is, it's out of town, um, at a farm, the Hildreth Farm. Uh, there was a warrant issued for the arrest of a man named Frank Hildreth, also known as Frank Coyle. I don't know why, he was apparently a bad guy. Uh, it was an arrest warrant for assault, and I think he had beaten up either his wife or maybe his sister-in-law, somebody. Um, I don't have all the details of the case, but uh, she was also named Hildreth, I do know that. And so Sheriff Schellenbarger took the warrant, took two deputies, and they went out to find Frank Hildreth and arrest him. Well, he was hiding out in the barn, and um, apparently Schellenbarger called out to him and said, we know you're in there, 
I have a warrant for your arrest. Come on out. And Hilda says, read me the warrant. And so apparently Schellenberger didn't read the warrant. And then Hilda appeared in the doorway of the barn. He said, I'm going to arrest you now. And Hilda said, no, I'm not going to go with you. And Sheriff Schellenberger said, well, I'm going to have to take you. At that point, Hilda pulled out a pistol and fired at Schellenberger. At the very same moment, one of the deputies who saw what Hildreth was doing pulled his gun and fired at Hildreth. Missed him completely, but Hildreth hit Schellenberger in the chest. The bullet apparently went just between the lung and the liver and lodged inside of his chest. Well, they got Hildreth, arrested him, took him into custody, rushed Schellenberger back into town for medical treatment. Now, all the stories that, that I read, the summary stories say he lay ill for five months before he finally died on October 3rd. But I've read news stories that tell a slightly different story because he actually kind of recovered. He was doing better, but that bullet was still inside him. They never, they never got the bullet out. And so in the fall, he was feeling okay, but they thought, we need to get that bullet out. And there was this new contraption that had actually just been premiered for... Um, most of the country the year before at the World's Fair in Chicago. In fact, um, it's conceivable that William McKinley, because he was at the World's Fair when he was assassinated, if they'd known that that uh, contraption, which they call a radiograph, we call it an X-ray machine today, they might have been able to locate that bullet and, and save McKinley's life. Well, that didn't happen. But they did take some X-rays of Sheriff Schellenbarger, and they saw the bullet. They think, we can get this bullet. And so he went to Mansfield for surgery. Well, they weren't as good as they thought, because they didn't find them. When they opened him up and tried to find the bullet, even though they thought from the x-rays they could tell where it was, they called them radiograms, um, they, uh, they tried to find it, they couldn't find it, they closed him up, and a few hours later he was dead. He probably bled to death internally. Mm -hmm. uh, Hildreth uh, was, they were going to, uh, there's a picture of Schellenberger, Hildreth was, uh, originally they were going to charge him with first degree murder, but it was reduced to a plea to, to a charge of manslaughter, and he did go to prison for that. But uh, Sheriff Schellenbarger died, and we have this, you know, there's, there's this gravestone. He was uh, buried in, in uh, Mount View Cemetery uh, next to his wife, who died many years later. Uh, she, that says, August 12, 1954, she was born in 1860. Four years wow. before he was, and um, and died in 1954. She was quite elderly when she died, so she survived in about quite a few years. There's also a plaque apparently uh, on the, the old B&O depot that was put up in memory of um, Sheriff Schoenberg. So it's, it sort of tells the story in in um, summary. So that's the epilogue to our story of two murders, one bombing. And it's one o'clock, so thanks for <laughs>